Uh, I am John Throckmorton with Tomo Drug Testing. Some of you have heard me before. <laughs> and thank you for still coming and showing up. I appreciate that. All right. For those of you who haven't or never heard of our company, that's okay. We're in the uh, Substance Misuse Testing and Programming Administration. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I have 15 minutes. This is not going to be an infomercial about Tomo Drug Testing. So if you're wondering about that, we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is we're going to talk on a very high level of how drug and alcohol testing can have an impact in the safety of your workplace. And when we're talking about work comp related issues, let me ask you a question. How many of you would rather wait until a work comp issue happens and then react to it? Or how many of you would rather be a little bit more proactive and potentially prevent that incident from ever happening? How many of you didn't raise your hand? Okay. I sure hope you want to be proactive rather than reactive. And that's how we work with individuals. We meet with clients and we discuss those particular options. I'm going to make the assumption that most of you who have businesses have some type of substance misuse testing program. Would that be accurate? Okay, good. All right. I am going to challenge you a little bit about that program because things have changed. Even in the last two years, there's a lot of things we're talking about at presentations and so forth that we weren't talking about two years ago. But the question we're going to keep in front of you is do you want to be proactive and hopefully prevent things, or are you just going to wait till they happen to react to them? All right? So the question is always why do we test? And there's a lot of different reasons. It may be your company culture. You may have to test under federal regulations. How many of you are covered by a particular DOT administration? Maybe you have CDL drivers or pipeline or stuff like that, okay? You are mandated to do testing and have to follow set regulations to do so. But each DOT administration has different rules. And so some of the individuals that we work with might be covered by two or three different administrations plus their drug testing uh, program for non-DOT employees. How many of you have operations outside of Missouri? Okay, a few of you do. You understand that the state regulations for Missouri are different than those for Arkansas or Iowa or Kansas. And so if you're operating in multiple states, you have to be cognizant of the rules and regulations for that particular state and for the individuals that work within that state. So things like that are reasons why we sit down and work with individuals about their testing program. Is it expensive to deal with substance misuse in the workplace? Well, it sure is. I mean, you stop and think about it. If it's going to reduce productivity, if people are going to have greater confidence and they're going to be more prone to having accidents, how many of you have ever had anybody in the back of your warehouse jumping from the top of a 15-high-foot pallet to the top of another 15-high-foot pallet about eight feet away? That ever happened to anybody? We heard that happening, you know, a few years ago with one of our clients. Uh, they were high on cocaine. They thought they were Superman and they were flying back and forth. So we want to try to prevent those things from happening. It all starts with your policy. If you're going to do drug and alcohol testing, you should have a drug and alcohol testing policy. If you're covered by a DOT administration, you should have at least two drug and alcohol testing policies. One policy is your drug-free workplace that covers all entities. The other one is your uh, policy that's specific to those individuals covered by that particular DOT administration knowing that and knowing the differences. We talk about post-accident testing. How many of you test after accidents or injuries? All right. Do you understand that there's a difference in the definition between an accident under FMCSA regulations and an accident under maybe your drug-free workplace policy? There's a big difference. And so if it doesn't meet the particular regulations of DOT, you cannot test under DOT. You have to test under your drug-free workplace. So it's things like that that sometimes clients uh, don't always look at. I've reviewed a lot of policies that have tried to meld the two. It doesn't work. So have very clear distinctions between your non-DOT policy and your DOT policies. That's very, very important. So who's eligible for testing? How many of you have safety-sensitive positions defined in your job descriptions? Okay, that's going to be a game changer. More and more, especially with medical marijuana and some of the other things coming into play, looking through your job description, have very clearly defined roles and what is considered safety sensitive and what is not. That's going to be an important factor. 
Violations. What happens if I'm an employee of yours and I violate your drug and alcohol testing policy? Am I slapped on the hand? Am I terminated? Am I given an opportunity to go through an employee assistance program? What are those terms? Are those terms the same for everybody? I hope to shout. I can't tell you over the years how many employers have told me, well, <clears throat> if Mike here fails his drug test, he's a good old boy. And we kind of like him. He does a good job. So we're going to give him a chance to go through rehab. All right? You thought I was going to pick on you, but I'm not. <clears throat> Fred over here, we don't like him near as much. So if he fails, we're just going to terminate him. Good practice? Absolutely not. It's got to be consistent. All right? <clears throat> what about developing a drug-free workplace program? Are you going to have a custody and control form? What type of test are you going to use? Urine? Saliva? How many of you have heard that you can do a drug test with saliva? A few of you have. How many of you know the benefits and the pros and cons of saliva testing? Okay, you need to know the difference. What about hair testing? <coughs> How many of you have heard about hair testing? Mark? Hey, Mark. Is it going to be easy for you and I to get hair tested? Uh, probably not, okay? So it, it, it's something that we've got to pay attention to, but hair testing is a viable option. There's a lot of trucking companies in Arkansas that do a DOT-mandated test uh, for pre-employment, but then they also do a hair test as part of their hiring process because hair testing can go back anywhere from, well, Mark and I, they're not going to get head hair, which goes back about 90 days, so they're going to take body hair, which can go back six or seven months. And so they're going to see if somebody cleaned up just long enough to pass their DOT test or if they've got a history of usage. So there can be some pros and cons, and knowing what each method methodology does or does not do is important. Sitting down and having those conversations with your provider is essential to know what's going to be best for your particular workplace. The DOT versus the drug-free workplace, we've talked about that, state and federal laws. Under what circumstances? There are up to six but four primary reasons to do a drug and an alcohol test. Pre-employment, random, post-accident, and reasonable suspicion. Of those four, which two are reactive? Suspicion and accident testing. So which two are proactive? Pre-employment and random. Out of those four, which, ones do you, which one do you think has done the least? Random testing, exactly. So we talked about the front being reactive or proactive. And yet, why do most companies not do random testing? You know one of the most common reasons we hear? What's that? Cost? Ah, uh, not as much. Testing positive because, somebody just said it. I don't, can't afford to lose the employees. I, ha I can't tell you over the years how many contractors have told me, well, if I test my employees, I'll lose half my crew. What's wrong with that scenario? Okay? But that is a reality. And especially when the economy's good, it's hard to find good employees. Yes? And so sometimes if it breathes, I'll hire it just because I need bodies. Could that be an issue? Absolutely. So having a clear policy that defines all those things is very important to you. And then the location of your testing. Most companies I talk to are familiar with testing and sending somebody down to a clinic. And Dr. earlier made mention about having a good conversation so your clinic knows the type of test and so forth you're doing, and that is important. But there is also on-site testing that's available to where you can have a company like ours, and there's others out there that can come to your facility and do testing. Sometimes that's a good fit. Not always, but in many instances it is. What options are out there available to you? If you have an accident at 2.30 in the morning, where are you going to go to get a breath alcohol test? Okay, things that we want to help you think through. All right, what are you going to test for? Federal tests tell you specifically the drugs you're allowed to include in a test. You can expand that in a drug-free workplace program. Make sure you know what you're testing for because a lot of people say, well, they, the, our person said that they were doing this, this, and this, and they tested negative. Well, maybe the test that you were using was not detecting what they were using. So you have to know what your test does or does not include. One of the most common things are the synthetic opioids, hydrocodone, oxycodone. 
Now, they're included in the federal drug test as of last year, but in your drug-free workplace testing program, unless it says specifically expanded opiates, you're probably not getting those drugs. How about fentanyl? Anybody ever heard of fentanyl? Is it an issue? Is it included in your drug test? In most cases, it's probably not. Because fentanyl is a drug-specific test that you're going to have to make sure that's added to your panel to get it included. Or unless you do what we call a med pro, which is testing for a lot like 14, 15 drugs. So knowing what your test does or does not include is important. Where am I out of my time? Seven minutes. Okay. I, I'm very conscious about time. All right. So I will shut up and sit down in 15 minutes. Now seven minutes. All right. Oral fluid is a very uh, beneficial trend. Been so for about the last four years. The accuracy of oral fluid lab testing is on the same level as urine lab testing. Now, the one thing that we're not real confident about is oral fluid instant testing. We just haven't found devices that we feel are in the best interest of our clients, although there are people out there that use them. There are some instant urine tests. There are some instant oral fluid, but we will highly recommend oral fluid lab testing. It's very beneficial because the window of detection is only about one to two days. Now, it's not good for pre-employment, but if you want to tell re you know, the relevance of where it, it was at in relationship to an accident. In other words, if, uh, if I test today with an oral fluid test because of an accident, and I test positive for marijuana, and my claim is that I smoked last weekend, the math doesn't add up because oral fluid is only going to pick up for one or two days. So that means if I tested positive today, I had to have used yesterday or maybe halfway through the day on Wednesday. So right now, the science is not there like it is with alcohol to be able to say that if I test positive for marijuana, I ingested four hours ago or six hours ago or within the last day. The science is not there. They're working on it, but it's not there yet. So oral fluid is a good alternative in many situations to at least say it had to have happened in the last day or two. All right? <clears throat> prescription medications. What does your policy say regarding the legitimate use of a prescription medication that impairs work performance? Has a warning label on it. You know, do not drive or operate heavy equipment. What does your policy say? I've read so many policies that say, well, then I just need to tell my supervisor. How many of my HR professionals would be happy with that policy? I'm not seeing any hands go up. I wonder why, okay? But, oh, I thought you were raising your hand. You're just telling me I got five minutes left to shut up, all right? Thank you. That's my boss back there. He's keeping me in track. That needs to be in your policy. It's important now as your policies are written that you have that fitness for duty statement in them because with marijuana, even if it's legal, is it an impairing drug? So the focus is not on whether or not you are or are not using marijuana. It's whether or not it potentially impairs you, and can you do certain safety-sensitive functions with a medical marijuana card? You may not be able to. So again, having the right wording is important, all right? <clears throat> One of the things we emphasize is if you have in your policy that you can never drink alcohol while you're on duty, how many of you have that in your policy? I mean, every company I talk to, can you drink while on duty? No. Make sure you write out what it means to be on duty. How many of you have ever attended a conference on behalf of your company? How many of you ever attended a conference where at the end of the first day there was a social hour? And at that social hour there were certain uh, beverages served? If you're, are you considered on duty while you're at that conference? So if you partake of those certain beverages, have you just violated your policy if the company says you can't drink while you're on duty? See? You got, sometimes you've got to make... How many of you are salespeople? How many of you entertain clients? Okay? If you're, are you on duty when you're entertaining clients? If your policy says you can't drink while on duty, you see where I'm going with there? Also, have a very clear written definition of what it means to be in violation. Your policy should not say you cannot come into work under the influence. It should say 
you're in violation of our policy if you're point zero two point zero four something specific like that so keep those things in mind it accumulates and dissipates rapidly based upon size gender tolerance basically for a guy who's 170 pounds you lose a drink an hour your alcohol goes up by about 0.01 to 0.02 per drink per hour. So it dissipates rapidly. We had one client that waited two hours before they did an alcohol test, and that two hours gave enough time for the alcohol to dissipate out, and the individual ended up being negative. So dealing with alcohol is important because it dissipates very rapidly. What do you do with marijuana? You listen for terms like uh, dabs, Mary Jane. You look for roach clips, things of that nature. But there's a big issue with CBD oils. And again, I'm not going to get through all this, but CBD oil is not federally regulated. So the question is commonly, if somebody uses CBD oil, will that cause them to fail their drug test? And the answer is maybe. It depends. Depends if there's THC in there. Who knows? You don't because it's not regulated. So making sure you understand what CBD oil is and is not. Also understand that medical marijuana is not a prescription. That's very important. Marijuana is not federally regulated. There haven't been enough studies, so it's not an FDA-approved drug. Now, there are a couple man-made drugs that have been used to reduce nausea and things like that that are out there, been out there for years. But the smoking of marijuana is not a medical thing it's not a, a medical prescription so keep that in mind uh, also understand you can test for some of the synthetic drugs and then one of the big things with OSHA and we're down to the one minute warning is training if you have supervisors we would highly recommend those supervisors go through some type of drug and alcohol recognition training for reasonable suspicion that's ex becoming more and more important in the estimation of accidents and so forth and if you've done th it once but it's been three or four years you probably should go through it again because the climate is changing so those are just some high level things that we talk about regarding your safety program because that's exactly what a drug and alcohol testing program is it's a safety program and if you'd like more information we're back there that's my infomercial thank you very much and thank you Connell for the opportunity to be part of the program today.